All right, welcome to another edition of the First Draft Podcast. And a reminder that the podcast is available every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern time. You can check us out on the ESPN YouTube page if you're into video as well. It is me and Mel Kuyper Jr. Todd McShay will be joining us in just a little bit. Now, Mel, I need to start the show with some news. And I'm not talking about Carson Wentz. We'll get to that in a moment. But it has been brought to my attention that your title at ESPN has recently changed. And I wanted to gauge your thoughts on this matter. You are now ESPN's senior NFL draft analyst, moving up from just the NFL draft analyst. How do you feel about this anointment? I don't know how to feel right now field i think when you look at starting at espn when i was 23 now being nearly 61 a senior is a good where's where's todd what's todd's new title is what i'd be curious todd to is also a senior nfl He's draft also analyst 42, yes he is todd is 20 years younger than me see i guess if i'm in the same league with todd as a senior i feel pretty good because we kind of where do we start senior at 40 now i may be at 40 Phil, yeah how old do you feel I'm 33, so I got some work to, got to do before I get to senior period end. there. But yeah. I think with, with Matt Miller and certainly uh, that with Jim Nagy and the young guys coming in, hey, we love all having all those guys in. I, I feel pretty good to survive, really, feel until you're six, nearly 61, starting at 23, seeing, uh, covering the gamut, seeing everything that went on between now and then. Uh, I guess it's an honor. I'll say it's an honor to be called a senior draft whatever, <laughs> analyst, <laughs> whatever you want to call me. No surprise, Mel, that you take it all in stride, one of your many hallmark traits, but uh, love having our well, senior Why is, is there any other way to do it, Phil? No, Mel, but others would not be as gracious as you are with this appointment of senior status. Uh, so that was one piece of, I guess, housekeeping. I didn't even know that until you told me. So that was something new information. I didn't even know that somebody gave me a title and never asked me if I was okay with that. Well, does that mean I'm you perfectly know, okay with it? May, may, is there a raise involved as well, Mel? This we can work on that. brings to light a lot of things I never knew. Every I know, we're learning a lot. something new on this podcast. So that's Every great. Tuesday, we're learning something new. Yeah. There also was some news this past week, mm-hmm. and we, we kind of – we talked about this last week, I should say. We talked about the possibility of a Carson Wentz trade, and it had been just sort of a matter of time. And we talked about two destinations, Chicago and Indianapolis, focusing in on the Colts. Let's just start here. Mel, what was your initial reaction to the trade, which sense for those that haven't kept up with all the specifics, Carson Wentz from the Eagles to the Colts in exchange for a 2021 third round pick, that's locked, and a 2022 conditional pick, that starts as a second, but can easily go to a first with Wentz playing at least 75% of the snaps this year or playing 70% of the snaps and the Colts making the playoffs. I don't understand it uh, from this standpoint. From, okay. If you have a quarterback who's 28 years of age, was only one of six quarterbacks in the NFL to throw for over 20 touchdowns and 10 or fewer interceptions, three straight years. He's in that elite select company with Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson. And he's had those great accomplishments. So what people do now, the haters come out and say, let's minimize his accomplishments, act like he's done nothing. And let's highlight all the false negatives. And you know, to me, I think, and I say false negatives, they come from this past year when he had all the injuries around him, the interceptions went up, completion percentage went down, performance level went way down. Carson Wentz isn't the guy. Why? Why isn't he the guy? Well, he's still the guy and it should be his team but somehow miscommunication changes, whatever. I don't get that. I don't know how you can't fix relationships field in this league, but Deshaun Watson, we're dealing with the same thing there with a 25 year old franchise quarterback here. We have a 28 year old franchise quarterback, but all of a sudden Indianapolis is saying, okay, now we got the guy at 28. Keep in mind, Phillip Rivers was 39 when they brought him in and he let him to the playoffs. So now we get this 28-year-old quarterback in what should be the prime of his career. And Indianapolis has got to feel ecstatic. And, and in Philadelphia, is Jalen Hurts the guy? Who's the guy? We don't know. I really think Wentz, that should have been his team in Philadelphia. It went awry, and they're to blame for that. To me, Wentz maybe takes some responsibility for that. But, hey, it's not up to him. It's up to the organization, the coaching staff, to fix and make sure those relationships are never broken. And it seems like in the NFL, we have broken relationships. I grew up when I was 23 to whatever age with John Elway and Dan Marino and all the quarterbacks and Jim Kelly with the Bills, where they were there for life. Once you get a great quarterback, he's here until he can't play anymore. His, his, his skill level declines a bit. That's not the case in the new NFL that we're dealing with now. It is so dramatically different. And I will say that uh, I, it seems inevitable that they were going to make a move with Carson Wentz. And it felt like, Mel, 
that it was a relationship that was beyond repair. I don't know whether Carson Wentz can get back to the play that we saw in 2017, maybe even 2018 and 2019. But it feels like if, is there a better place or would there have been any better location for him to land than Indianapolis? And does this impact their draft plans at all this year in your opinion? Well, you think about that left tackle spot and and they have a lot of money that they put towards the offensive line with, with obviously Ryan Kelly, Costanzo retires, you have Quentin Nelson, you have Smith. So this line is right now missing a left tackle piece. I just, I have a new mock coming out on Thursday, mock 2.0. Is a left tackle going to be there? Are they going to mm-hmm. reach a little bit? Were they going to wait or wait till the second round or make a move in free agency? What are they going to do? They don't want to spend more money. So you would think the draft would be the way to go. You could use a pass rusher as well. So that's going to be an interesting decision to make on where, where I have them going in terms of that 21st pick in the first round. But uh, they're in great shape. I think if you look at the division they're in, Jacksonville is going to start over now with Trevor and Urban Meyer coming in. Houston's got to figure it all out. Will Deshaun even be there by the draft? Maybe not. Tennessee's Tennessee. They're good. They're not great. So I think when you look at at Indianapolis, yeah, they got to feel pretty good right now. They got a 28 year old quarterback, the 39 year old future Hall of Famer retired, and all the key pieces should be in place to let the, allow this team to make one heck of a run as they did with Phillip Rivers. Keep in mind, if it wasn't for some questionable decision making by Frank Wright in that Buffalo Bills game. The Colts have a great opportunity to win that football game. So now you have Carson coming in. There's no reason to believe he can't be a great quarterback again. And to me, uh, Field, it brought to light one thing. When we talk about Carson, and we, I'll tie it into the young kids, taking, taking into consideration what they said about Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, and now what they're saying about Justin Fields. Sure. Scouts and analysts will say these quarterbacks in college have to see it. They, can't, they don't throw guys open. They don't anticipate, right? They have to see it. Well, I blame the scouts and analysts for not anticipating, not having foresight. They have to see it now to believe in that quarterback. Well, what about coaching that quarterback up? Vinny Serrato always told me that's why they have coach in front of their name. And that's what you saw with Josh Allen in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. So this notion, well, he doesn't throw with the anticipation. He's got to see the guy. That has to be coached. And that's something where the NFL did their job in terms of Brian Dayball and Ken Dorsey in Buffalo to elevate Josh Allen to this great level he's at. Let's see if they can do it with, say, a Justin Fields. And in terms of Carson Wentz, the Colts with Frank Wright, perfect scenario for him to revert back to the form that he showed just a couple of years ago. You know, they say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But one thought that has been pushed or brought up for the Colts with their left tackle problem right now, Mel, after Anthony Costanza retired, would be entertaining the idea of Quentin Nelson kicking out from left guard to left tackle. He's on, I think it's fair to say, a Hall of Fame trajectory at left yep. guard. But given that there's not a sure thing at left tackle, would you consider doing that to a player who's playing so well at the spot that he has known his entire career? He's capable of it, and you're not able to get that left tackle in the draft, and it may not fall that way, or they may feel we're better off going that route because we have so much money in the offensive line. Let's put him out there and see if he can handle that critical left tackle spot. You can find guards. You can find them that are adequate or allow you to play at a high level. So for me, yeah, that would be something they have to consider strongly because that's something you didn't expect with Anthony Costanzo. They got that. Think about it. They got their left tackle retiring. They got their quarterback, Andrew Luck, who's only 31 years of age right now, as we speak, retired a couple of years ago. So they had two big blows here. Franchise quarterback, elite left tackle, all lead the game before they were really thought to be you know, in that position to even think about that. So, yeah, I think that's an option. That's why pass rusher at 21, there's going to be some intriguing guys there. Jalen Phillips at Miami. Gregory Rousseau, formerly of Miami. Would he pay at Michigan? Uh, Jason Owe at Penn State, who may have an unbelievable pro day coming up at Penn State. Jason Owe, some think, could run into four threes at 6'5", 260 pounds. Now, he didn't have a sack this year, so he's an enigma. He's kind of a polarizing player. But on Thursday, you'll see where I had Jason Owe going in Mach 2.0 because he's the kind of guy you project what he could be as opposed to what he was at Penn State. He may be looking at a heck of a pass rusher once he's in the National Football League. The age-old traits versus production conversation. I think the Eagles side of this might be more sort of interesting as it pertains to the draft here, Mel. And we don't know who is going to be available at pick six when the Eagles make their first pick. But take that part out of the equation right now. Do you believe quarterback is a need for the Philadelphia Eagles? Or if you were Howie Roseman, their GM and head of football ops, would your mindset be, 
our starting quarterback is Jalen Hurts. You know, I don't know how you feel that Jalen Hurts is automatically the guy, but you're almost forced to feel that way. Because if mm -hmm. you do draft a quarterback at six, and let's take Mac Jones, Alabama, Trey Lance, North Dakota State, assuming that Zach Wilson, BYU, and Justin Fields, Ohio State, are gone. Even if Fields is there, do you take Fields to go with Hurts? Do you take Mac Jones? To me, I, I talk about sideways moves. Is that a sideways move? Did you see enough from Jalen? to feel like he could be the guy. We know he's a great leader. He's a great kid. He wins. And he showed that dual threat capability. He gave defenses some trouble. No question about it. Uh, but that was in a, in a situation where they didn't have a chance to prepare. You didn't see it coming. All of a sudden, he's out there doing some good things. You also are going to be staring in the face field at pick number six, either Jamar Chase from LSU or Devontae Smith from Alabama, yeah. two elite wide receivers. Jalen Waddle, Alabama, also in that elite category, had not been for his, his ankle injury. So you have three receivers that are going to be there. Probably two of those three could be there at six. Do you pass on them to take a quarterback? I don't think so. I think at six, you take one of those receivers, you go forward with Jalen Hurts, you see what happens with him, and then next year you decide what you want to do in terms of a quarterback. But I think Jalen Hurts right now, because of by default, by the trade of Wentz, I don't know if you say he earned it or he showed enough, but I would stick with Hurts and see how he evolves, how he develops draft Chase or Smith, and then go forward there and then see you reevaluate after the second year with Jay Lawrence, which will be his first full season, knowing he's going to be the guy. And also knowing that defenses now will know he's the guy and can prepare for him. We'll see how he deals with not only him getting better, but defenses dealing with him in a better way. Same thing we're talking about with Lamar Jackson in Baltimore and other quarterbacks that are young in the NFL that are those dual threat quarterbacks. Hey, Mel, can you think, and this is sort of putting you on the spot here, of a team – picking in the top six, eight, maybe even let's put it top 10 where they took a quarterback because it was just the way the board felt. And what I'm getting at is that it feels to me like almost every instance of a team using a top 10 pick on a quarterback is because the mindset going into the draft was we're taking a quarterback. And so I tie that to the Eagles, meaning if they're taking a quarterback at six, that's because that was their plan going into it. Not because, hey, the board broke a certain way and we just couldn't pass that player up. Yeah, it's a valid point. Uh, and I think it, it's also what we discussed a little last week when Todd and I were talking about forcing quarterbacks up the board. And we see right now between 2009, you, I think you referenced it this week, uh, we talked about it, the 2009 to 2016 quarterbacks, okay, that went. In that, uh, in that first round, what's it, 0 of 22 now, still with the team that drafted him, right? Yeah, you know zero it's amazing. 0 of 22, you, you referenced that. So now with Wentz gone, none of them are there. And we've talked about some of those quarterbacks that their grade really wasn't indicative of what type of player they would be based on where they were drafted. So their grade didn't really work in unison with where they were picked. And that's what you want. I always say, why draft a player at 8? If you're drafting a quarterback at 8 or 6, he better be in your top 5 on the big board. You're not going to draft the quarterback at eight when he's at 12, 15, just because he's a quarterback. That's what gets you in trouble is over drafting quarterbacks. That's why I didn't want to rate quarter. I don't want to worry. That's where a mock draft can screw the heck out of your mind and really screw you up in general is because you worry about where a guy may go. Let's keep my ratings in line with that. Yeah, that should never matter. But we're all human and we don't want to look stupid. So we don't want to have a guy wait. I remember when I had a quarterback and I won't say who it was. And I remember the producer of the draft screaming, hey, you know, he's not on your top 40 big board. He's going to go in the hot top group. All right. Put him up a little bit higher if you want to just make a point. But he's not going in the top 30 in my big board. So yeah. rate players the way you think they are as players and prospects, not where they're going to go. And so when you look at your board and you look at where that quarterback is, and if you're picking, say, six and you're the Eagles, and you got quarterbacks ranked below that, but you got Jamar Chase and Devontae Smith in your top five, don't stretch it for the quarterback. You got Jalen Hurts. Move forward when you can get a guy because that's what gets you in trouble. That's what leads to the Jake Lockers, the EJ Manuels, the Christian Ponders. I can go on and on of that list and that right. grouping uh, that, that were pushed up because they're quarterbacks. It seems like Philadelphia has done some self-scouting and they realize they're probably at the beginning of this building process as opposed to ready to compete. But they now have some extra draft capital both this year and next to get to it. Uh, we're still trying to get Todd connected, but we're going to dive into Todd's latest updated big board. And obviously, Mel, you know these players as well as anybody as well. So we'll play some ping pong here with sure. some of Todd's movers and shakers on the board. So we know Trevor Lawrence is not just the top quarterback in this draft, but the top prospect in this draft. 
Uh, Zach Wilson is his second highest ranked quarterback, and he's now moved up to player number five overall. Mel, I think this is going to happen much more over the next two months than it has over the last two weeks. But these quarterbacks have started to drive some really compelling conversations recently. And it feels like Zach Wilson, maybe even more so than anybody. A uh, lot of talent, but and, and this wasn't the question I necessarily intended to ask you. Is it possible that Zach Wilson could be the riskiest quarterback amongst the top four that we're talking about? I don't think most risky is, 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 is Zach. That I'll say that for this reason, Field. He has more of a body of work than, say, a Trey Lance does. Trey Lance only has 17 career starts, only one start this past season, and it was at the 1AA level. Now, we can argue about the schedule at BYU, but it's 1A. So, I, and, and, and for even Mac Jones, only 17 career starts, four last year, 13 this year. So that start number is risky right there. So that's Lance and Jones and Lance from the 1AA level. Fields is being criticized a lot by various people that you hear comments about, you know, he doesn't throw guys open. He's got to see them open. I, I talked about that already. It was the same criticism of Josh Allen, the same criticism of Justin Herbert, I heard. And everybody was saying that Josh Rosen is the most NFL ready. The year that Josh Allen came out, when they were all criticizing and hating one Josh, and they were praising Josh Rosen, praising Sam Darnold, and didn't want to hear any criticism of Darnold, but were, were attacking Josh Allen all the time. Same thing with Herbert last year. Jordan Love's got better arm talent than anybody. Tua throws with better anticipation, all this stuff. So I, I think you got to be careful. I don't want to ever hear, I know I'll never say it, and I hope you never say it, Field. I'll caution Todd never to say it. Matt Miller, Jim, Matt, never say a quarterback who's most NFL ready in a draft. Because it's never made sense and it's never worked out. And for a quarterback so raw, I don't want to hear what they're all who isn't raw coming out of college. Hey, Manning was in my in this house, he was standing right here in this kitchen saying, No, they were telling me I didn't have any any upside. I'm 22 years old. Okay. I still got some pimples on my chin and I'm, I'm I have no upside. It's like, right. give me a break. You know, I'm hearing all this ridiculous chatter about, you know, this guy's got more upside and he's as good as he's ever gonna be. All this nonsense. So I think we got to get back to what history has taught us is ridiculous nonsense and learn from past history. History tells us what's nonsense. And some of that talk has been ter turned out to be total garbage. So I think we got to be careful with quarterbacks here, learn from it. And Justin Fields is the one that I'm hearing the same criticism, ironically, Josh. Justin, now another Justin, right? Yeah. We got all the J's, Josh yeah. Allen, Justin Herbert, Justin Fields. Same criticism of Fields is the same thing I heard about the other two. I'm going to leave Fields where he is. To your question about Zach Wilson, no, I do not think he's the most risky quarterback in this draft. Yeah, I guess I th that, that thought came to mind only because, you know, we've heard people talk about whether he might be the top quarterback on some team's board. Ahead of Trevor? Yeah, ahead of Trevor, which – I, that that's to me that I, when I hear that I think back to when I remember debate Drew Bledsoe and Rick Meyer when they came out and yeah. other quarterbacks remember RG three and Andrew Luck some liked RG three I know. But remember I that know. whole thing field totally yeah it wasn't consensus that that Peyton Manning was the I mean Peyton we'll go back to Peyton in a minute with Ryan Lee but it wasn't a consensus on Andrew Luck a hundred percent consensus there were those out there that had RG three ahead of Andrew Luck there were those out there I think fifty percent of the people I talked to when Peyton came out that had Ryan Lee and I wasn't one of them but there were some that had Ryan Lee had a Peyton Manning now, I had a high grade on Ryan Lee the only thing I can say take a little solace in is I didn't have leap ahead of Manning so right. but some did so I think we're getting into this now where as soon as we creep closer to the draft you get everybody trying to get cute yeah. everybody tries to get a little cute now and again remember remember Todd last year Jordan Love over Justin Herbert and I'm not saying Todd's going to do it with Trevor it's going to be somebody else doing that not Todd not me but you're always going to hear those kind of curveballs that people try to do to get attention on this whole Trevor Lawrence thing. And I'm not buying into any of that nonsense. Trevor Lawrence is lock, stock, and barrel number one quarterback in this draft. And I, I know Fields outplayed him on the field. I know Burrow outplayed him on the field. But it goes more to the quarterback. It goes to the team. The quarterback isn't the sole entity that determines whether you win or lose a game, even though we like, like to lead everybody to believe that's the case. But in the case of, of Trevor Lawrence, he is without question the number one player in this draft is without question one of the highest rated quarterbacks I've ever drafted him with 43 years of doing this. And I believe that Zach Wilson would be a reasonable pick, very reasonable pick at pick number two for the Jets if they went that direction, if they're going to go quarterback. I don't think that's a, a great reach if that were to be how it plays out. But the number two player on Todd's board, regardless of position, 
is Jamar Chase, who, of course, opted out of this past season after winning the Blitnikoff the previous year at LSU, and that was a loaded offense, and he still stood out. You know, is it going to be – is there is there a lot of merit, in your opinion, Mel, for breaking the tie between Jamar Chase and Devontae Smith? Is it going to be clear to you by the time April 29th rolls around which one is the better of the two wide receivers, or how is how large is the gap, if at all? That is one of the most difficult evaluations to try to figure where those two receivers belong, which one ahead of the other. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot of battles like that. Caleb Farley, cornerback, Virginia Tech against Patrick Sertan, Alabama. There's a lot of that going on with Justin Fields, Zach Wilson, all that going on at various positions. But with Chase, it's interesting. Had he played this year, and understand why he did with COVID, with business decision about losing all those players around him, led by, of course, by Joe Burrow. I get it. Of course, it was a terrible year overall for LSU on the field. But I think you look at Jamar Chase, you couldn't have contact with opt-outs. Yep. Team scouts couldn't go there, keep checks on them, work them out, do anything with the opt-outs. They had no contact with opt-outs. So you, how's their body? What kind of – how's their weight? What have they been doing? How have they been training? All these things. Devontae Smith had a phenomenal year. Devontae Smith went out and produced week after week against elite opposition. It's hard to say I'm going to still leave Chase, who had a higher grade going into the year than Devontae Smith did. But with him not playing, and all he had, remember, he two, the year before he had that great year in 2019, he had some drops. He had minimal production. Then he goes up from like 20-some catches to 84 with 20 uh, touchdowns and a 21-yard average per catch with Joe Burrow and Justin Jefferson on the other side. And Devontae did it all these years, no matter who was with them. They took those receivers away. Jalen Waddle gets hurt. No problem. I'm still going to light defenses up. So I'm going to stick with Devontae Smith over Jamar Chase. But there are a lot of people in the league that I talk to, Field, that have Chase over Smith. So for, for Todd, there's nothing I can talk about critically about him having him at two. Um, personally, I think uh, right now it's still edged. Smith over Chase, but both are in the top five. Both are very high on the board. And you're nitpicking if you're talking about whether it should be a two or five or Smith should be ahead of Chase or Chase should be ahead of Smith. That's almost a flip of the coin. Yeah, you know, it's funny, Mel, is that there, I'm not saying there's no pressure on you to nail the evaluation. Like if at the end of this process, you have Devante ahead of Jamar or vice versa, like it's going to be something that people take note of. But the real pressure is on the first team to take one of those two players. Let's say it's the Miami Dolphins at pick three. If they take Devontae Smith and he ends up with, you know, I don't know, a really good career, but Jamar Chase has an outstanding career, then the Dolphins are going to have some sort of referendum against them. Whereas, you know, the evaluation, you were accurate. Like, they're both going to be really good players. The real pressure is on whoever takes one of those two players first, but the dividends are substantial because of how talented those, talented those guys are. And speaking of talented players, uh, Mel, uh, Todd has Kyle Pitts, the Florida tight end, coming in at number six. And the great Peter King, uh, in his most recent Football Morning in America column, which we encourage everybody to read weekly, was very gracious to follow uh, or to pass along some of the nuggets from last week's podcast. We discussed this, Mel, is that you, it may not be the single highest tight end prospect, but off memory, Kyle Pitts is the highest graded tight end prospect you had in terms of where he stacks up in his class as a potential top five player. Yeah. How, how much different is he than a Vernon Davis or a TJ Hawkinson or some of the other really highly drafted tight ends we've seen over the past 15 or so years? Yeah, we went to all the names. I got them all here. A lot of tight ends had high grades, but this is the highest ever for me. Uh, you know, in terms of a tight end, he's going to be way up there. Kyle Pitts is uh, in the mock. I'm having them going really high. And I think he's a difference maker. He's a nightmare and you can move him around. He can block adequately enough to be an inline guy. If you want to move him in line as tight as a traditional tight end, you can flex him out, slot wide, do everything you want with him. Uh, he's phenomenal. He's going to go very high and he's going to be an elite tight end, hopefully, in the NFL moving forward. He's going to be expected to be. Uh, just to go back real quick, Field, to finish up what you just said about my, Miami's interesting at three because Devontae Smith was with Tua. So if you're yeah. moving forward with Tua, you might like Chase a little better if they're equal. Does it push you because Devontae worked with Tua and was mm -hmm. there at Alabama with him? That complicates that a little bit when you start projecting Miami, just to finish that whole conversation about Miami up in terms of where they'll go. And bigger doesn't always, even though Chase is a bigger body, doesn't bigger doesn't always make you better. We go back to a lot of receivers that came out that weren't quite as big as a guy went ahead of them, turned out to be a little bit better. So, yeah, if they're great, they're great. A.J. Green, Julio Jones. And to your point about taking the one that's left, alleviates all the pressure on you 
If you take the receivers left, you're in great shape. Philadelphia yeah. takes Chase or Smith. We took the one was left. I talked about that last uh, week with the quarterbacks. You take Ben Roethlisberger, Rivers and Manning went first, great. You take Josh Allen after Sam Darnold went and, and Baker Mayfield went, great. So for me, there's nothing wrong with that. It varies. But let somebody else make that tough call. We're happy. Remember last year, uh, Tom Telesco said, hey, I'm the Chargers at six. I'm happy getting any one of the three. Yeah. end up with Justin Herbert. Pretty good, right? So sometimes it's better. Let them make the calls. If we're if we're happy with the way the players are graded, with getting the guy that falls to us, and we're not stretching it for a guy that we're, we're picking six, we're getting a 12th best player. As long as we're getting the guy inside that six and the grade aligns with where we're picking, I'm happy letting somebody else make those tough calls. And there are a lot of positional, very difficult calls because of the opt-outs this year with some of the elite players you know, in this draft. Yeah, it's, it, and I feel like there's some can't go wrong. It's six in one hand, a half dozen of the other picks that you're going to be making at certain positions in this year's class. Not tight end, though, as we discussed. It's Kyle Pitts is clearly in a tier unto himself. But there's going to be a healthy conversation about the cornerbacks. And you mentioned Caleb Farley just a few minutes ago. For those that haven't followed him as closely, he opted out. He actually was, I think, the first really notable player to opt out of the 2020 college football season from Virginia Tech. And in Todd's most recent big board update, he had Patrick Sertan the second, of course, the son of the longtime NFL cornerback, falling from player seven to player nine overall. Caleb Farley goes from 18 to 10 overall. How would you compare and contrast these two, both in terms of body type, skill sets, and NFL upside or readiness? See, Todd always gets on me for do, having some method to the madness. And I know you do this for this. <laughs> what Todd did there was try to get these guys closer. He conveniently right, right. moved one down and moved one up to close that gap. See what I'm saying? He wanted to close the gap for two guys that are arguably one and one A. If you like the technically sound, fundamentally sound, more experienced, more complete corner, you take Patrick Sertan the second. You take the guy who's the elite cover guy potentially, but doesn't tackle as well, former wide receiver, not as experienced, you know, more, not as complete because the tackling and the ability to, 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 you don't want to be playing with 10 guys in the NFL with the bubble screens and space guys that you got to tackle, got to come up and run support. So that would have been an area that Caleb Farley would have needed to show improvement on this year, but he didn't play. So that makes the Sertan Farley debate moving forward, very difficult to try to figure out. So what Todd did, he closed that gap and put them right there. That's what I do on my big board. If I got two guys that I'm trying to figure out. I'm putting them, boom, right next to each other because that's how close they are. It's splitting hairs between a lot of guys at various positions in this draft. And Farley and Sertan are right there. The third cornerback is probably J.C. Horn from South Carolina. Who the fourth cornerback is, Field, is another great debate. I mean, we could do show after show and spend 40 minutes to an hour just on one position. Because that's going to be, there's going to be some incredible discussions in those war rooms about players at various positions and how we decide, do we take this guy or do we take that guy? Uh, Gregory Rousseau and Jalen Phillips, same school. One play two years ago was great. One play this year was great. They're both were the same number, both at Miami, Rousseau and Jalen Phillips. That's going to be an argument. So it, it's going to be, I think, a very fascinating, I said mysterious back in August. It is very mysterious. And to see, was it Micah Parsons from Penn State who opted out, go ahead of Jeremiah owusu koromoa from Notre Dame, who played and played really well. Oh, it, it's going to, I think it's the more entertaining this year covering the draft field than it's ever been in my 43 years of doing it. Wow. I mean, that says something right there. That's incredible. I mean, you've been doing this, as you mentioned, 43 years. So that certainly makes for a fascinating potential positional and breakdown. By the way, Peter King, our good friend. Love Peter. He's been a Love great Peter. friend of mine, a great supporter. Peter, thank you for watching. Thank you for promoting, doing whatever you can for us here with the podcast. Peter knows this game inside. He's a Hall of Fame, uh, you know, I call him football analyst, analyst guru. Uh, and I think Peter King knows the history of this game as well as anybody. And these debates that we're having one after another, even at, along the offensive line, the corner, linebacker. Then we got Landon Dickerson, great center at Alabama, got hurt late, had, had a couple injuries, but he's a great player. Yeah. Interesting to see on Thursday whether I have Landon Dickerson in my first round mock field. I cannot wait for that. Landon Dickerson, who, of course, tore his ACL late in the season for Alabama. If not for that, I mean, we're talking about him as probably a lock in the first Guaranteed. round. Yep. His quarterback is likely a lock for the first round. That, of course, being Mac Jones, who has moved up from Todd's overall number 32 player to number 28, a grade of 89. And 
obviously his stock is is going north right now, Mel. You and I were having a conversation before the show began, wondering kind of what the floor would be for Mac Jones. But is this, given that Todd has him at 28 on his uh, most recent big board, we think Mac Jones will go well before pick number 28. Is it possible that he's going to get squeezed into that dynamic that we've been talking about where quarterbacks artificially get thrust up the board because of the position they play, but it's going to wind up being a bad decision? Could that be the case with Mac Jones here? Mac Jones isn't Joe Burrow, but his situation is kind of like Burrow. Right. In different ways, feel because you know Burrow beat you with his legs. Mac won't. Okay, right. Mac's you know that quarterback pocket guy, limited mobility, athleticism. Where Burrow, athletic kid, can move, can beat you with his legs. So that that's not a comparison that's really accurate. But the situation I think is similar. Burrow had an okay year, then a phenomenal year. Yep. You know, Mac Jones only has 17 career starts, so he went from four starts to the guy. So in August, field. When you started out in August with Burrow, you had him way down the line. So then you start moving, when you start moving up, how far can I move him up? Well, you had to move him up to number one at some point, right, or in the top five. But that's a quantum leap from where he was in August. Mac Jones in August was way down here. Now he's got to be way up here. So it's hard. When you start out with Trevor, he's up there, right? Zach Wilson, we had to move up a lot because this was his only great year. Justin Fields was already up there. So when guys are already up there, you tweak them a little bit. When guys come out of nowhere, like Mac Jones did and Joe Burrow did, boy, you got to reconcile in your mind, and we're all human, that, okay, these guys are deserved to be up there, but I got to take a guy that I might have had 60th in the season again and put him up in the top five. You got to do it. Teams are going to do it. Why can't we? So I, I'm going to see where Todd ends up with, with uh, Mac Jones. He's going to go, I think, no later than 15 to New England, certainly eight to Carolina, and that complicates things with Carolina. They had him for a week in Mobile. Matt Rule did. Yeah. There was nothing not to love about Matt, uh, Mac Jones. You were there, Field, in Mobile. He was great, right? He was great. They were certainly – I mean, everybody gravitated towards Mac Jones. I think it's impossible not to in that setting – uh, and, and as you mentioned, I mean, it, he may not be Joe Burrow as a prospect, but the numbers were very Joe Burrow-like in 2020 compared to what Joe, Joe Burrow did in 2019. It'd be really interesting to see how the quarterbacks get pushed up the board. And Mel, of course, the difference between the NFL draft and other professional leagues is that the NFL draft takes place after free agency. So for all we know, some of the teams that we are penciling in as quarterback targets they could have their answer at quarterback before the draft actually begins. We have another mock draft coming out this week. Is that correct, Mel? I have it right here. Oh, it's down. Can't oh, see it. Oh, look at that. There All right. It's gone. <laughs> now, it's coming out on <laughs> Thursday. I might be able to steal it and see it. But well, no, you're going to be. Now, I can't. You can see through that. But whoop, whoop, there it is. But it's going to be up on Thursday. Okay. It's all right there. I got trades. I'm projecting trades for the first time in my life. Okay. I got doing that. Todd already did it. I'm doing it here. I only had three new guys in from the previous 1.0, three guys out. A lot of guys shifted around from where they were. So that will be out the Thursday early. We get up with Greeny all through the day. We'll have specials, all kinds of shows covering the uh, Mach 2.0 this Thursday. Okay, that'll be great. I'm hosting NFL Live on Thursday and Friday, so I'm sure we'll have you on. If not, I'm Mm going to push for it. But looking forward to Mel's next mock draft. That includes trades. That right there is a wrinkle. 43 years. Who says you can't teach an old dog new tricks? In the meantime, I'm a senior senior analyst. I got to adjust Mm -hmm. and live up to that senior reputation. That's one of the perks you get for becoming a senior NFL draft. I make the rules. I break the rules. Seniors can do anything they want, right? You get to throw trades into your mock draft as if the exercise wasn't difficult enough as it is. In the meantime, we ask if you'd be so kind to help us by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to the podcast, which drops every Tuesday right around 4 p.m. Eastern time. Our goal next week is to have Todd, Todd, Todd back. But in the meantime, Mel, our senior NFL draft analyst, have a great week. Can't look, uh, cannot wait for the mock draft this Thursday. Thanks, you. I appreciate it, bud.